Why don't we go ahead and get started? Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Vicki Johnson. I am the membership coordinating at Voice Thompson membership coordinator rather at Boys Thompson Arboretum. I'm excited to be here today with Ron Rutowski. Um, we are going to be talking about caterpillars today, the plant war with caterpillars. Um, Ron is Professor Emeritus in the School of Life Sciences at ASU. For more than 45 years, he has studied the production, function, and perception of bright coloration of animals, especially in butterflies. Um, he's currently president of the Arizona Central Arizona Butterfly Association and leads butterfly walks and butterfly counts at Boyce Thompson Arboretum and other venues in Arizona. So he knows what he's talking about. Ron, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Go right ahead, thank you. Okay, thanks Vicki and hello everybody and welcome. Vicki, uh, just one question. Do you, do you uh, is there an indication how many people I'm speaking to? Um, 14. Great, okay. Well, that's great. Thank you all for coming. Um, today I'm going to be talking, uh, I did one of these about sometime in the middle of the summer, sort of overviewing the butterflies that occur at the Ar Arboretum and some, and some of the results of the counts and things that we've done out there. And when uh, I was asked to do another one uh, for, for the, uh, the beginning of this month, um, I chose a different topic, which was to talk about caterpillars, which sometimes you see, sometimes you don't, and their relationship with plants. Um, as I understand it, this is uh, supposed to be the beginning of Butterfly Month, but at the Arboretum, I haven't heard too much more about that from Shelby Linda Smith, but uh, uh, the, I think you can expect to hear more about, about butterflies uh, as the month proceeds. So um, I, the plan for today that I have is to, to uh, in a general way, to talk about this relationship between butterflies and their, uh, their larval food plants in particular. And what I want to do is uh, first present a kind of case study of a butterfly, to review the life cycle of a butterfly that occurs at the Arboretum and uh, its relationship to the plants that, that are involved in its life cycle. And then I want to spend a little bit of time in the middle of the talk going over some of the ideas surrounding how plants and herbivores interact and focusing on a specific observation, which is that uh, most herbivores don't feed on all the plants available to them but feed on some subset of them. And uh, we can talk, I wanna talk about how such a situation uh, arises both in immediate terms and in terms of the evolutionary history of the plants and the, and the, and the herbivores. And then finally, I'm gonna finish it off by talking about one of my favorite butterflies at the Arboretum, the pipevine swallowtail and uh, its life history, its relationship to its larval food plant, and some of the consequences of its relationship with its larval food plants that, uh, that uh, for its life, its coloration, and its biology. So again, the, the general tone of today will be, or general theme of today will be about the relationship between herbivores and, and the plants on which they feed. So I'm gonna begin with this butterfly. This is one called the variable checker spot. It does occur at the, the Arboretum. Um, as you'll see, there are only certain times of year when you'll actually see this butterfly at the Arboretum. Uh, if, if you're at, there at the right time of year, where you will see it is, is here in the vicinity of the, uh, uh, the uh, at the sort of Eastern end of the High Line Trail or High Trail. So uh, again, if you're out there at the right time of year, this is one area where you're particularly likely to see this butterfly, the variable checker spot. The best time to see the adults is in the spring, um, March and April are when the adults tend to be flying around and you'll see uh, males like this one on the left here perched on, the, on a plant, in this case, a, a small acacia plant and sitting there waiting for females to fly by. And when the females fly by, 
uh, the males fly up and chase after them. If the male, if the female is so disposed and the male uh, succeeds, he will mate with her. Here you can see a, a female variable checker spot and a male coupled together. The ends of their abdomens are, are, are coupled together and uh, mating takes about an hour or so. And, uh, and then once they, they've completed mating and separated, the female goes about the business of laying eggs. Now she doesn't just lay eggs anywhere. She uses a specific plant that grows in that region on those hillsides uh, uh, near the high trail in that part of the arboretum, a plant called the chaparral beard tongue. It's a large bushy plant. I'll show you another picture of it in a minute. And uh, the females lay their eggs on the larval poop plant. Here's a female. She's laying eggs. She's laying a cluster of eggs, which are, are, are right here. Um, and you can see this uh, particular uh, stick has several egg clusters on it here, uh, on it. One here, some up here. Oh, here's some down here is sort of pinkish color. So they tend to uh, change color as they, they age. This, the egg stage lasts about um, three or four days, at which point a caterpillar hatches out. And the caterpillar starts the business of uh, going, of eating the leaves of the chaparral beard tongue. And here you can see a, a, a group of caterpillars from what, that, that have ha recently hatched out from one of these egg clusters. Um, the caterpillars produce a sort of silken web that you can see here, uh, uh, perhaps to some extent protective, but they get about the business of eating. And here they are, here's a group of them uh, a little later, a little larger. At this point in the year, the, the, this is probably like in April, uh, mid-April, late April, maybe even early May, the chaparral beard tongue starts to flower. It has beautiful yellow inflorescences um, that uh, you can see on the hillsides. So the larvae are basically eating machines. And I wanted to emphasize that a caterpillar, ha you know, which is going to ultimately turn into a butterfly, has a body structure, basic body structure, three-part body structure that we find also in the adult butterfly. So there is a head. Here's the butterfly head uh, near this white bracket. And the caterpillars also have a head. We'll see it perhaps uh, more clearly in some of the other pictures. It's often tucked underneath here. The caterpillar has uh, some little eye, uh, light sensitive structures there. I hesitate to call them eyes. They're uh, very primitive. They also have mandibles and uh, that they use to chew leaves and they have a mouth that they can uh, ingest food. The adult butterflies have a thorax shown bracketed in yellow here with three pairs of legs as is typical of, of insects. Insects are called hexapodes because they have six legs. And uh, here you can see the three pairs of legs on the thorax of the caterpillar. The rest of the caterpillar, like the rest of the butterfly over here is, uh, is, is where the abdomen is. Butterflies have basically no appendages on their abdomen. The only appendages uh, really are the legs and the wings which arise from the thorax. However, in the caterpillars, we do have some uh, very simple sorts of legs, more simple in structure than the three legs on the thorax, called prolegs, which are used by the caterpillar to hold on to the leaf as they feed. And you can see that pretty clearly here in, uh, in this video. Uh, this is one from the uh, Norfolk Botanical Garden. And it's a picture actually of a moth caterpillar. And this is in real time uh, feeding on a leaf. And you can see the head of the caterpillar quite clearly there, the three pairs of legs. And you can see uh, that it's using its mandibles to chew, uh, bite off pieces of the leaf which it then ingests and uh, then it starts down its path through their digestive tract, through the thorax and into the abdomen and ultimately comes out the other end. So this is what caterpillars do. They're really eating machines. They don't do much else. 
And as a result, and they, uh, their body size from the time when they're these little tiny eggs until they're a full grown caterpillar increases, their body size or mass increases to the tune of a thousand, two thousand, or even three thousand times. So they, there's this tremendous growth that occurs during, uh, during the caterpillar stage in these butterflies. Now back to the, uh, the variable checker spot. Um, the variable checker spot, uh, I, I, again, as I said, the adults fly in March and April. The caterpillars start feeding and uh, feed on the chaparral beard tongue. Here's one right here until sometime in May. And what happens is that they're kind of pulled up short because the plant, it turns out, is deciduous. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. So in May, the leaves on the chaparral beard tongue start to dry out, turn brown, um, fall off. And, but this is before the caterpillars have ha had a chance to complete their feeding. And so what do they do? Well, we're not really sure, but they disappear off the plant. They go through, the larvae go through about five molts or shedding of the skin growing a little larger with each molt. And they, they typically molt about, uh, about this happens that the larval food plant dries up uh, at about the third molt. So they're not particularly big. They're maybe about a, a quarter of an inch long, maybe a half an inch long. And at that point, as best we can tell, they leave the plant and go down into cracks or crevices in the ground under rocks. We don't really know because although we've looked out for them, we can't find them. But when the plants leaf out again in the winter, and in particular in December and, and starting in December and going into January, the larvae reappear on the plant. They, the, the larvae are suddenly back there and they're feeding on this new growth and they then get larger and larger until they get big enough to where they can actually um, go into the chrysalis stage. And this, uh, so this is going on in January and February. The chrysalis stage is, I think, kind of is, is pretty. I mean, here's a caterpillar on a prickly pear pad. They don't eat prickly pear, uh, but it's on a prickly pear pad. It's hanging down and about to shed the old larval skeleton or old, old larval skin. And when they shed that, what's underneath is this, the skin of the pupa and it's hardened. And then the animal goes into this pupal stage. Here's, here's one on a uh, rabbit brush and, and here's one on a, again on a prickly pear pad. The pupal stage, the, uh, oh, sorry, doesn't eat. And uh, it, uh, it lasts about, uh, about 12 days, at which point a butterfly comes out of the pupa. And then we start all over. You know, we're, we're again at March, April, the adults flying around, mating, females laying eggs, and it goes on like this. So the lifespan of this animal from egg to adult is about one year, but it's kind of broken up by this period where, where they're not, uh, where the larvae are somewhere uh, sort of hibernating or estivating in diapause, whatever you want to call it. So I present this not only because it's interesting and it's something that does go on on the, uh, on the grounds of the Arboretum. Again, you can watch, see a lot of this stuff going on on the high trail there at the eastern end of the high trail. But I, to also to make these sorts of points, the butterfly life cycle has four stages, egg, caterpillar, pupil, adult, fair enough. It is only the caterpillar that eats leaves. Um, and in fact, the, ca the caterpillar is the only stage that eats uh, food that has substantial nutrients in it. The butterflies themselves, as I'm sure you all know, are, are nectar feeders, nectivores that visit flowers and have a proboscis that they stick down into the flowers to suck out nectar. But nectar is really only sugar water. And so it's all, so in terms of uh, sort of overall balanced nutrition, it's only the caterpillar that's eating anything that has fats, proteins, um, and, and lipids, these sorts of things. So the, the pupil stage, whatever goes on in there, uh, in terms of building the butterfly has to be done with resources that it was the caterpillar that collected. 
the adult have the adult butterfly the muscles and the fats in its body the organs in its body are have all been constructed off of the nutrients that were consumed during the time when this animal was a caterpillar again the adults just feed on on nectar which doesn't have really which really doesn't have much more than sugar water it's a good source of energy but it's not a good source of building materials for constructing an animal's body and the fourth point is as you can see from this uh, this uh, case of the variable checker spot the life cycle is closely tied to the chaparral beard tongue the caterpillars don't feed on anything else uh, that we're, at least not locally here and so we have this very tight intertwined relationship between uh, this butterfly and this one species of plant that occurs in central Arizona here, the chaparral beard tongue. Now this, this kind of close relationship between a species of butterfly and a species of plant or a group of plant species, closely related plant species, is, is a common feature of butterfly biology. People who get into watching butterflies quickly learn that uh, a given species of butterfly is going to be associated with certain species or certain group of species of plants. And this is reflected in the check sheet of butterflies from the, for, for the Boyce Thompson Arboretum. So here's the first page of this ch uh, check sheet. Um, the total count is about 80 species or so that have been observed on the uh, property of the Arboretum. And you can see that for each species, like here's the black swallowtail right here with the first one in the list. And it's, it's right there provided for it is, the lar is one of the things that the, with one of the kinds or the kinds of plants that this animal uses. And you can see that, it, 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 that each species, whoops, oh, sorry. Each species has a slightly different plant that it's associated with. For the black swallowtail, it's, it's plants in the carrot family, the umbilifers. Here's the, pi the pipevine swallowtail. We'll be talking quite a bit about more about that later. Aristolochia, Dutchman's pipe. Um, and uh, th one of the reasons we list these on these check sheets is because when you walk around the garden, when you, you can look for some of these food plants. And if you hang out at those food plants, you might be more likely than not to see the kind of the butterfly that tends to be associated with it. So when you're in the legume garden, you can see up here that legumes like senna and the legume family are listed here for several butterflies. And these are ones you might be expecting to be particularly likely to see uh, in the legume garden at the botanical gardens. So it's the, so we that information is provided on the check sheet as sort of a, a, a guide to know what plants to look for and what butterflies to look for when you're in, near different kinds of plants. Some of the other associations here's a Empress Lelia butterfly whose caterpillars feed on desert hackberry. I don't have a real good picture of one of their plants, but uh, here's uh, their their whole life cycle again, like with the chaparral beard tongue and the checker spot. Is, is very tied together with this plant. Uh, the males, the females lay eggs on the plant and the males actually uh, sit on the plant or near these plants waiting for females to appear to mate with them. Uh, these, uh, the very, that Empress Lelia and that desert hackberry are particularly uh, common in these areas of the, of the arboretum. Uh, right here near the Smith Center and in the Australian desert uh, exhibit. Also over here at the east, sort of the east end of the, the trail loop, especially right here as you're going along the riparian area, there's a, a really a, a lot of uh, desert hackberry growing there. Another plant that has a close association with a butterfly, like mo many of the plants in the garden, is this uh, is this uh, salt bush here. There's a, quite a bit of atroplex growing right along the, the roadway that parallels the picnic area um, there. And, and there, although you have to look pretty hard because they're really little, there's a tiny, tiny butterfly whose larvae feed on this uh, salt bush called the Western Pygmy Blue. And uh, they're very small and can be hard and fly very fast. But if you stand at this bush and look around long enough, you're very likely to see Western pygmy blues. Now this, and uh, again, that's, that's right in this area, right uh, on the roadway going uh, sort of Southeast from the, the parking area. 
Now, here's a, an attempt to, I, I kind of like this figure for several reasons, but uh, it's an attempt to, this figure is an attempt to show some data on, you know, this sort of characteristic of butterflies that they tend to, a given species tends to feed on one or a very small number of sort of plants or types of plants. So what we've got here is on the, on the x-axis is, uh, well, first of all, each dot is a species of butterfly, represents the information or summarizing information for a given species of butterfly. And uh, what, oh wait, I seem to have lost my cursor here, just a second. Oh, sorry, okay. So, uh, and so on the x-axis here, we've got the number of host plant genera, gen a gen genus of plants is, uh, is a group of closely related plants. So, um, yeah, so just different kinds of milkweeds would be all in the same genus, but there could be different species within that genus. But what you can see here is that if you look at how these, uh, there's like 182 species of brush-footed butterflies, how they're scattered along this line, you can see that most of the species, there's some variation, I'll talk about this one up here in a minute. But there's, some, there's, there's some variation, but most of the butterfly species within these brush-footed butterflies are down here at this end, that, uh, that most of them are feeding on 10, it was like one to 10 plant genera. And that, does, that sounds like a lot, but it's not a lot compared to the total number of plant genera that have been described out there by botanists which is 28,000. So of the 28,000 plant genera, most species of butterflies will only feed on one to 10 maybe genera um, of, of plants. So they really have a very restricted uh, diet. They, they only feed on certain things. Uh, oh, shoot, I keep doing that. This, this, this other axis is geographic range, and there's a general trend that the uh, larger a species geographic range, the, the butterfly species geographic range, the more plant genera they feed on. But again, it's this concentration down here that I really want to uh, focus on. But I will just digress for a moment to tell you about this one way up here, you know, feeding on 60 plant genera with a huge geographic range. And that is probably, that is the butterfly with probably the largest geographic range of any butterfly in the world. It's one that occurs at the Arboretum called the Painted Lady. And uh, it's larval food plant. They feed on mallows, they feed on thistles, they feed on just a whole raft of different things. And what's interesting, uh, just a naming thing, you know, it has a huge geographic range and uh, probably its, its tolerance for eating a large number of different kinds of plants allows it to have this huge range, geographic range. But it's, it's, um, it's common, one of its common names in Europe, in particular, England in particular, is not the Painted Lady, but it's called the Cosmopolite, <laughs> which, which is indicative of its huge geographic range. So just to give you again another sort of basis for comparison about this restriction to a very limited array of plant species that we find in butterflies, this is not uncommon among human uh, herbivores. So for example, humans, uh, there are about 400,000 species of plants, not genera, but 400,000 species of plants. And hu as humans, we eat only a small fraction of all of that. I think uh, worldwide, uh, there we are supposedly we people eat on a regular basis about 200 species of plants, and worldwide most of our nutrition comes from only about 30 species of plants, and this includes maize, rice, wheat, and over half of the uh, calories and proteins eaten eaten globally come from this very restricted number of species of plants. Again, in butterflies, each species uses a, also uses a very limited array of plant species from only one to about maybe 20 species, a few more and some others. 
So why, the question I want to pursue now is this one of why is the number of plant species consumed by a butterfly species or even herbivores generally so limited? And I really want to, uh, I'll talk about butterflies, but I can, some, in a minute here, I'm going to go broader and talk about herbivores generally. We can deal with two kinds of ex answers to this question. One is, the, is just how does it happen in, a, in an immediate sense? How does it happen that during the course of a butterfly's life, the caterpillar only feeds on one kind of plant? There are two sort of immediate causes to this. I'll, I'll go in a minute to more evolutionary causes. But the immediate, one immediate cause is that the caterpillar eats the plant where it hatches. And so if females are only laying their eggs on a few species of plants, uh, then uh, caterpillars will only eat those plants where it hatches. And this is what goes on. Here we see a gulf fritillary laying an egg on a passion vine. And that's really the only thing they lay eggs on. I have a passion vine in my backyard and often there are two, three, four female Gulf fritillaries hanging around there looking for good places to lay eggs on the plant. They're not hanging around the other plants in my yard. It's that one in particular. Uh, here we have the, the variable checker spot, female laying egg on chaparral beard tongue. And they choose, they're very choosy about where they lay their eggs. They choose the plants based on the chemical composition, the chemicals that they detect on the leaves using their four legs and antennae. They use their eyes and uh, can actively select among plants on the basis of leaf shape and color, identifying those plants that they, they tend to prefer. They also will avoid laying eggs on plants where there are other eggs or caterpillars so that their offspring don't have to compete. They often lay eggs primarily on new growth where uh, the new growth is more tender, perhaps less chemicals in it. And also they'll lay on parts of the plant that are in shaded habitat or good habitat. So female preferences for laying eggs on certain kinds, certain plants uh, is part of what causes this restriction. Another potential cause is that larvae themselves may have some uh, strong preferences for what they feed on. So if you take a caterpillar, most people discover this pretty early, that if you take a, if you find a caterpillar wandering around in your yard and you put it in a, uh, in a jar or something and put in a food, they won't just eat anything that you put in with them. It has to be the right kind of food. And so caterpillars clearly have food preferences and there's some, uh, there's a lot of interest in whether these food preferences are learned somehow or whether they're, they have a strong genetic component and, uh, and are innate. And there's evidence for both of these things. There's some evidence that you can, if you work with a caterpillar for a while, get it to feed something other than what it might really prefer. But it's, that can be pretty difficult, and these genetic factors really become um, important. So those are, again, these sort of immediate potential causes of, uh, of, uh, very, of a caterpillar eating only a very restricted diet, restricted to one or a few species of plants. We can also ask questions about how, they, how this, the relationship between the caterpillar and the plant came to be over the many, many generations that butterflies and plants have been on, on the earth. So these are what we would call evolutionary explanations. And uh, of course, the, the, the process, one of the real key processes that drives evolution is what we call Darwinian natural selection. And so we might explore, see if we can think about how selection might have caused uh, butterflies to uh, have evolved this close association with certain species of plants and not others. So we'll draw heavily on some of the ideas of Charles Darwin here. By the way, uh, well, I'll come back to that in a minute. So we've got two organisms here involved in this interaction. So we need to think about their perspectives and how they might be different and uh, and what the consequences of these perspectives might be. So I want to look first at the perspective of the plant and then at the perspective of the butter of the caterpillar or the butterfly. From the perspective of a plant, plants don't benefit from having herbivores around. I mean, being eaten is not a good thing. You lose fitness. The, you know, the, if you can develop characteristics or if you can somehow develop 
uh, yeah, develop characteristics that are have genes that that cause you to to re, that that allow you to reduce the level of, of um, consumption of herbivores that goes on. That's going to be a good thing. So. Uh, so plants uh, are under selection to develop defenses that will prevent them from being eaten or reduce the likelihood of their being eaten by herbivores. However, uh, all, like all characteristics of organisms, such defenses might have costs. We can think about that in a minute. You know, if you're a rose bush and you're producing thorns uh, that that help prevent you from being preyed upon or feed fed upon by herbivores, those thorns have to be produced and there's an energetic cost associated with producing those thorns. So presumably plants are gonna have defenses that produce the best benefit to cost ratio. What then is the optimal protection or optimal defense one might evolve? That gets tricky because uh, the, the array of herbivores that are feeding on a plant can be so diverse and change so much from one place to the next. So, you know, plants at the Arboretum, there are herbivorous mammals there, there are uh, rabbits there, presumably there are deer that come through sometimes, um, probably also some herbivorous birds. There's also a whole raft of herbivorous insects out there, including beetles and and butterflies and moths and all sorts of things. So, so it's difficult for biologists to sort of predict uh, what specific defenses might arise, but I think you can make the general expectation because of plants, plants out in the arboretum might be exposed to a large number of different types of herbivores that they might be expected to evolve broad spectrum defenses. That seems to be what the sort of thing plants have done. And they've developed several types of defenses against, uh, uh, what are they, several categories of defenses against herbivory to limit or prevent herbivory. First of all, they're mechanical things. I mentioned the thorns on a rose bush. Those presumably are, are to somehow uh, minimize or uh, reduce the likelihood that, that plants will be uh, eaten by herbivores. The leaves, if you look closely at them, have uh, uh, little, uh, little tiny needle-like structures often on them. This is, a, uh, this is actually stinging nettle. And not only do they have these sharp, uh, sort of silicaceous spines on them, but they're hollow inside and they have uh, toxins inside those spines that make them also very unpopular with, with herbivores. Um, plants are, these are called trichomes. I'll say a little bit more about those in a minute. Spines is another thing. The desert hackberry plant has nasty spines on it. It's not a pleasant plant at all. Plants are notorious for having stiff cell walls made of cellulose, which uh, help protect them. There's also, plants also have evolved a whole raft of broad impact, broad spectrum chemical defenses. And uh, these are generally compounds that they produce and they're, they usually have no other function than defense. So they're not just part of the metabolic machinery next, necessarily of the plant, but uh, plant compounds that they produce specifically for the purpose of, uh, of deterring herbivores. And there's a whole raft of different kinds, terpenes, uh, there's, uh, which are, are uh, which are produced by things like pine trees, the piney smell that you get, those are compounds that are thought to be defensive. Citrus oils are, are compound, terpenoid compounds that again are thought to be defensive. Alkaloids are another class of compound. Caffeine is, a, is actually thought to be a, second, a plant defensive compound um, and, the, and among the alkaloids. Tannic acid, which we taste in wine, uh, is, uh, you know, a lot of it's not, a little bit of it gives a little bitter tang to something, but a lot of it is not good. This is a group of things called phenols, a group of compounds called phenols. And the, the chemical defenses have been further subdivided or categorized by some uh, plant biologists and people interested in herbivore plant relationships as being either constitutive or inducible. Constitutive uh, 
chemical defenses are those that are just always present from the time the plant first starts to grow. They'll uh, uh, create, they'll synthesize certain defensive compounds uh, that have direct effects on the herbivores by making the herbivores sick or making them gag and, and uh, choke. Uh, there are also constitutive defenses that act indirectly. A lot of plants produce sugar water that is excreted through extra, extra floral nectaries, not in flowers. Here we see an ant visiting one of these extra floral nectaries. The plants do this to draw the ants onto the plant and uh, where the, uh, the ants as they're marching around now, well, it might, only, might not only visit the nectaries, but might also find caterpillars and attack them and, and uh, carry them off to the nest as prey. There are also a number of inducible chemical defenses where uh, some of those with direct effects, these toxic bitter compounds, uh, can the plant can actually ramp up the production of these things if it detects that it's being in, uh, eaten by an herbivore. And this is especially true for some insect herbivores that the plants have uh, uh, information processing capabilities where that they, they can detect a uh, uh, herbivore chewing on them, uh, then they will ramp up the production of the, of the compounds that might have direct toxic effects on these herbivores. They're also, uh, chew, a plant getting chewed can induce the production of uh, compounds that have indirect effects. Indirect effects by actually attracting uh, predators again, like uh, an ant, or attracting parasitoids, uh, uh, in other insects that will lay eggs on a caterpillar, and the, the larvae from those eggs will go into the caterpillar and actually feed on it and kill it. And so, and of course, that, that's good for the plant, not so good for the larvae. And then finally, there are also phenolo what are called phenological uh, uh, adaptations or defenses where plants will have evolved certain growth patterns that uh, avoid getting preyed upon by herbivores. I won't go into those anymore today, but just that, you know, plants might uh, evolve a system where they tend to grow during that time of year when the credit, when the herbivores are not very present. Now the perspective from the herbivore in this relationship is quite different. Um, we expect that herbivores, you know, if they will evolve what we would have been referred to as counterploys to deal with evolved plant defenses. These counterploys, like the defenses of the plant, have costs as well as benefits, and will favor and and uh, are likely to favor uh, targeted uh, def counterploys targeted for specific plants. It would be very costly for an herbivore to have counterploys that would work against all the, de the plant defenses that they might encounter during their life or, or in their habitat. So instead, it seems that the best cost benefit ratio comes from f focusing your adaptations on specific plants. So herbivores may often be selected to specialize on countering the specific defenses of some plants, plant species and then feed specifically on those. And this will lead to what is called host plant specialization, which is exactly what we're sort of talking about here. So this is, these are a set of ideas that make this prediction about host plant specialization, which is pretty much what we're trying to explain. Okay. So in terms of evolutionary history, then we get something that looks like this. It's a series of events. Plants, plant defenses evolved to avoid being eaten by herbivores. Herbivores evolved counterplays to disable or circumvent plant defenses. Then over evolutionary time, plants are expected to evolve defenses to reduce predation by those specialists that have come to be able to feed on them. And that will, and this will just be an iterative process that will go on and on. And so the, this has been referred to by biologists since sometime in the 1950s or 60s as an evolutionary arms race, uh, a sort of arms race between the herbivores and the plants. 
Now, as an example, I just wanted to throw up one little digression here as an example of some of these ploys of plants to counter the uh, specialists, we see things like this. So once you have a plant, like a passion vine, uh, that, that has ca butterfly caterpillars feeding on it, uh, one strategy that plant can use is to produce structures that look like eggs. And as I mentioned earlier, females prefer not to lay eggs on plants that look like they have eggs on them already. So here's a passion vine, the leaf of a passion vine, which consistently develops these little yellow spots on it that look like butterfly eggs. And this actually reduces the probability that a female butterfly will lay eggs on them. Uh, they're also emitting chemicals that attract predators and parasites. These are things that presumably have evolved after uh, the specialists have already sort of come to focus on a certain species of plant. Also, some people have suggested that uh, once the animal has a specialist feeding on them, that might defoliate them periodically. They, uh, the, the plant might develop strategies for dealing with being defoliated at, peer, at intervals. And so some people have suggested that tuberous roots like carrots, radishes, may be, uh, have evolved in the context of uh, being able to cope with or survive being defoliated by some specialist herbivore periodically. So again, plant, this is just to suggest that plants, you, you get this sort of evolutionary game going where the plants develop defenses, the herbivores counterploys, the, the uh, plants develop counterploys for those herbivorous uh, organi organisms, defenses, and, and it goes on from there. Okay, well, I'm going to close it out here and I'll tell you the last segment here with a case study from the Arboretum, one of my favorite butterflies, this pipevine swallowtail, the uh, uh, Batis philonor is the scientific name for it. It has a, a for, it has a life cycle like the uh, variable checker spot. Its larval food plant is this a thing called pipevine, Aristolochia watsoni. That's the one it feeds on locally. And uh, females lay eggs on Aristolochia. Here's some eggs up here you can see on the undersurface of a leaf. Here's the caterpillar um, sort of midway and it's uh, in increasing its body size, uh, body mass a couple of thousand times. Here's the, the pupil stage, which they hang off of uh, stems and stuff like that. And here's this uh, beautiful adult butterfly, swallowtail butterfly. Um, if you want to look for the pipevine uh, pipe and the swallowtail butterflies, a good place to look is in general this area around the Australia, Australia Desert Exhibit and the, uh, and the Smith Center. There's quite a bit of, uh, of uh, pipevine growing here, right about where it says Australian Desert Exhibit. There's quite a bit of it growing over here near the legume garden. There's a large raised bed right on the, le uh, the edge of Silver King Wash that has just tons of, uh, of pipevine there. And you, and you can often go there. Uh, I bet you could go there right now and find caterpillars of the pipevine swallowtail feeding on, that, on them as the, the, there. Um, the, uh, the basic story, I'll just follow this up the, in the same, I, with the same idea, the plant perspective, the larval food plant is Aristolochia watsoni. It is, it is only one of the pipevines on which the pipevine swallowtail lives. Uh, the, the, at least in the United States, the range of the pipevine swallowtail is shown in blue here. It's quite extensive all across the, uh, the south and southeast here and actually extends down into Mexico and Central America. And uh, the local Ariz Aristolochia watsonii, you know, that's here in Arizona. I think it gets over into New Mexico and Texas, if I remember. But over here in, in the Midwest and uh, along the East Coast, the pipevine swallowtails are feeding in on other species of, um, of pipevines. Um, but, it's, but they're all in the genus Aristolochia. The plant 
it has several defenses that it's evolved uh, for to, and and some quite general. So the, they one of the things they do is their chemical defense is the production of what are called aristolochic acids. These compounds, if it, if you ever had organic chemistry, you can look at this and see that it's a bicyclic or multicyclic compound with some nitrogen and oxygen and carbon and stuff. Um, but there are several, this is called aristolochic acid one. There are a number of different forms of aristolochic acid. And so um, it's, a, yeah, they, they produce a, quite a few of them. Uh, these aristolochic acids are both toxic and bitter. I've never actually tried them myself, but, <laughs> uh, but they are supposedly, birds do not like this stuff, but uh, you know. And uh, the aristoloke acids are, uh, that the plants produce, they produce both constitutively and uh, they can be in, in induced. So um, they, in other words, uh, when a pipevine is, starts to be fed on by a herbivore, they ramp up their production of these aristolochic acids to try and deter or poison the herbivore. Their, their aristolochic acids are toxic and have a number of metabolic effects on vertebrates. Uh, and not eat enough of this stuff, a human eats enough of this stuff, it can actually uh, uh, poison you. It can it, it'll wreck your liver. And there are other pharmacological things they're, they're, that are, they're known for. Um, they also have trichomes on the leaves uh, that uh, presumably deter herbivores. The leaves are reported to be tough they are pretty tough little leaves. They're not particularly large. But then, and they also have a tuberous root that is thought to have perhaps evolved in this context of being able to survive um, uh, being defoliated by a, a, pre, a herbivore. Uh, the swallowtails have come to specialize on them um, and they can have a pretty significant effect on the pipevine. In a study done some years ago by Mark Rauscher and Paul Feeney in, in Texas, they found that in a given area in Texas, 45% of the annual leaf crop was consumed by pipevine swallowtail butterflies. Really a huge amount of plant material. And this leads to increased mortality of the plants and also decreased growth rates. Um, I guess, I don't know if I can show up here, I, I think, uh, I, I don't know, down here there's, this is a museum preparation of uh, pipevines, of a pipevine, uh, but they're, one of the things that the, the tuberous root is just sticking up here. I don't know if you can see it from the pictures. I've, I, my, my face is there, but, and Vicky's too, but it's there. So quite a long tuber, about an inch in diameter, a tuber that these, this pipevine has. The, from the herbivore's perspective, the pipevine swallowtail's perspective, there are several interesting things that, that come from this. One is that uh, the larvae they found can somehow detoxify these aristolochic acids. They're really not very negatively affected by these highly toxic and bitter compounds. I will tell you that, you know, searching through the literature, it's very hard to find any, that I couldn't find any real uh, general, any real uh, empirical evidence for how they detoxify these aristolochic acids. Um, there is a general class of, uh, of uh, enzymes for detoxifying things like this called monoamine oxidases. People think maybe those are involved. They're known to be involved in detoxifying other sorts of, uh, other sorts of toxic chemicals, secondary plant defenses, and presumably these pipevine swallowtail larvae are doing the same thing. It is known that they actively sequester these aristolochic acids, meaning that if you feed a caterpillar a certain amount of aristolochic acids, and then you look at what comes out in their poop, the amount of aristolochic acids, it's less than, much less than what went into the caterpillar. So the indications are that the caterpillars are actually sequestering the aristolochic acids. Maybe this helps them deal with some uh, them somehow. But one of the things it clearly does is it makes the caterpillar itself distasteful. 
and that the aristolochic acids that are consumed by the larvae and sequestered by the larvae are subsequently found in all of the life stages. So the adults have aristolochic acids in them and are distasteful. The pupae have aristolochic acids in them and are distasteful. The eggs have aristolochic acids in them and are distasteful. And this opens up a whole other array of uh, consequences of the uh, of these secondary, these these plant defenses, chemical plant defenses. That is that it opens up the uh, since now all the life stages like the of uh, the butterfly, like the plant, are distasteful. It opens up the possibility for the evolution of warning coloration. So these butterflies use these aristolochic acids to deter predators, to repel well, to deter predators, and they've developed a coloration that makes them easy for predators to recognize. And so the caterpillars of the uh, pipevine swallowtail are always easy to see. They're really quite brightly colored. And here you can see this one is this bright orange coloration. So if you go to the area where there's Aristolochia or pipevine growing at the Arboretum, you just have to look, it's not too hard to find the caterpillars because they tend to be fairly big and very brightly colored. The adult butterflies have this coloration on the ventral wing surface here uh, with these orange spots, an iridescent blue field. Uh, and this, this is regarded as a warning coloration. And in fact, some of the work that came out of my lab a few years ago done by Kim Pegram at the Desert Botanical Gardens showed that uh, these two color this coloration does serve as a warning coloration and both the orange and the blue coloration contributes to the ease with which uh, predators can or predators can learn to re recognize this butterfly and and associate that with its distastefulness of course that opens up a whole other realm of possibilities which is that of having potential mimics and so the pipevine swallowtail that occurs at the arboretum there are at least two species of butterflies at the arboretum that are recognized to be and actually have been empirically demonstrated to be uh, mimics of the the pipevine swallowtail the pipevine swallowtail is what's regarded as a distasteful model and there again at the arboretum there are at least two butterflies that are palatable, relatively palatable, more relatively more palatable and can and mimic the coloration, have evolved a coloration that mimics that of the red of the pipevine swallowtail. One is the red spotted purple, which you're probably especially likely to see in the riparian areas uh, on the property and in and near the arboretum. Their larvae feed on on willows, I believe it is. And then the black swallowtail, which uh, again is another one that's common in the desert areas here, including the arboretum. So, so the the point here is that the, the you know you have the this relationship between the plants and the and the butterfly, and this can have implications. Obviously, has implications for the plants and implications for the butterflies, and implications for the butterflies and their relationships with the animals that prey on them. So in summary then, uh, as you may, not have, may or may not have been aware, but I think many people are, the lives of butterflies and plants are tightly intertwined. And it's more than just the fact that butterflies feed on, flower, feed on nectar of flowers, but caterpillars and plants have a long and antagonistic evolutionary history, uh, uh, history of interactions. This evolutionary arms race has produced an amazing array of fascinating and puzzling adaptations that biologists are still trying to understand. There's many, many opportunities for additional studies on, on insect butterfly plant interactions. And there are also uh, many great examples of these adaptations and these relationships at the arboretums. And I encourage you to, to look for them when you visit, look for these relationships and the, the guide, the, the checklist with its co-listing of butterfly species and plant listings is plants, is, is plant species, a great, great uh, guide for looking for these sorts of interactions. So at that point, I'll stop and I'm happy to take answer verbally any questions that might have come in, Vicki. Uh, I do, uh, if you enjoyed this webinar, obviously we encourage you to, to 
to support the Arboretum, uh, the, there are butterfly walks that are held where we talk about many of these relationships. I think there's some more webinars lined up that will talk about butterfly plant relationships or some with the monarchs. Notice I did not even mention milkweed. I hardly mentioned milkweed or monarchs today. And that's because I think there are some other talks that have been lined up uh, on those animals in particular, but many of these same principles and ideas apply. So thanks again very much. And uh, Vicki, if there are questions, I, I'm happy to take them. Um, thank you, Ron. Yes, we have a question here that says, what are the best months to see cats at the Arboretum and the Sonoran Desert area? Uh, by cats, caterpillars, I assume that's what's meant. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Abbreviating there. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, well, there... The pipevine swallow, well, during the warmer months, I would say between April and, and November are a good time to see uh, pipevine swallowtail caterpillars. They're probably the caterpillar that you can see most, one of the caterpillars you can see very reliably. Another uh, kind of caterpillar that is not too difficult to, to see or is often at the garden is, um, or at the arboretum is, uh, are the ca caterpillars of queen butterflies, which feed on milkweed. And they are, uh, they're there, it, and especially there's a lot of milkweed that's, that's grown and planted in the demonstration garden. And if you go there and closely inspect the uh, milkweed plants, you're very likely to see uh, queen larvae. I know that uh, uh, when I lead butterfly walks at the Arboretum, um, we almost always find, larvae of both of those species. And again, it's in the warmer months, anytime from April through to October, or November. Um, also, you know, the, but the, the checker spot, you could see, I'm sure you can see their caterpillars if you, but that would just be in April and May. Uh, or I'm, yeah, April and April, May and February, yeah. But uh, so those are really kind of the best times. It depends on uh, some extent on the species, but a lot of caterpillars are really hard to find. They're very cryptically colored and tend to hide out. And so um, these larger ones like the queen and the pipevine, which are not only large, but also because they're distasteful, tend to be warningly colored, tend to be more easy to find. Is there... Um... Pam asks, is there a relationship between the giant swallowtail and citrus? Yes, yes, uh, mm -hmm. the giant swallowtail, it's larval, yeah, it, it's larval food plant it, uh, is citrus. It doesn't really uh, lay its eggs on anything else that I'm aware of. Its caterpillars, I think, are pretty locked into it. Uh, citrus trees, as I mentioned, there are uh, secondary chemicals or defensive chemicals in citrus leaves as well. They're terpenoid compounds, some of the citrus oils, lemonone or something that I can't think of the name of them offhand. And so presumably the pipeline, the, the uh, uh, giant swallowtail has the ability to detoxify or reduce the effects of those compounds. Mm. Let's see. There's another question. Let me get to that. I am handicapped and have a scooter to get around. Can I use it at the Arboretum? How many trails could I use with my scooter? Um, yes, you can use your scooter, Judy, and uh, get around. If you, uh, there's a lot of trails that are accessible to you, and, uh, but there are some areas you'd want to avoid. And if you talk to the staff at the visitor center, um, they would be happy to tell you where, where, what to avoid. Uh, but yeah, you're, you're gonna be able to see a lot uh, in yeah. a scooter still. Yeah, Do you the have anything to add, Ron? Yeah, the demonstration garden has, I mean, they have this sort of sunken area planted specifically to attract lots of butterflies with some of the flowers that they really like as well as larval food plants. And uh, the, that, that meadow, as it's called, uh, is just down a paved trail and has a paved trail going around it, uh, a paved trail from the parking lot. 
uh, or the picnic area parking lot. And so, yeah, there's a, a number of uh, accessible areas that are um, where there's lots of butterflies. So yes, you should be able to do that. Thank you. Let's see. I'm always fascinated by how colorful the um, caterpillars are, how, and is that, that's a primarily a defensive mechanism, the um, hairs and the colors and they're yeah, fascinating that, uh, to me. Yeah, um, I guess, what, what am I thinking here? The, the, um, you have to be a little careful sometimes. I mean, the, you know, the, the pipe vine swallowtail is, uh, the caterpillar is either black or this bright orange coloration, which clearly stands out against the, the background of the green plant. But many caterpillars that look quite um, uh, uh, conspicuous or brightly colored, it's actually because the places where they're likely to be found are the plants on which they are found are, are brightly colored. So I think if I go back one slide here, that's it's I don't know if you see this yellow caterpillar here mm -hmm. uh, in the picture in the lower right. That caterpillar actually when it's on the food plant is quite inconspicuous. Oh. <laughs> so it, it you know the how conspicuous and uh, bright an animal appears uh how conspicuous it is really is uh you have to see where they tend to occur to decide if it's really um, a kind of a warning coloration or or bright coloration um it it is, is still i guess as you point out vicky it would be if it's make even if it looks bright when they're sort of in isolation if you put them on the plant and they're not very conspicuous, presumably that's a, an advantage in the face of uh, predators. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Kirsten has a question. Um, she says, I've seen pipeline caterpillars that are black with red nubs. Do you think that is a regional difference from the bright red? Uh, that's a, that's a, 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 a neat observation, Kirsten. And, uh, it turns out that uh, the coloration of the pipe vine swallowtail caterpillar is temperature dependent. So it varies from one time of year to the next. So if I go back a slide or two here, yeah, to this one, here's a pipe vine swallowtail uh, caterpillar. Um, like you described, it doesn't really have the orange, the black spots on it, but it's definitely bright orange. They tend to be bright orange during the summer when they, um, and the, but in the colder weather, they're, they tend to be more black than orange. I, I think one I showed earlier was mostly black. But, and it's thought that this is a, a, a adaptation to the thermal environment. So with these animals, they like to, it helps their digestion if they can elevate their body temperature. And so when it's cooler out, uh, they tend to have a coloration that's more black, and that way they absorb more solar radiation, re elevate their body temperature, and it aids their digestion. But during the summer, if they're black, they're going to get entirely too hot, and so they evolve or they they develop this this other coloration. I don't think I think it it happens the the determination of the colors happens sometime between the egg hatching out and the caterpillar getting up to a certain size. I don't I don't think it's I don't think they can sort of instantly change their color from black to red. So it's a developmental thing. Mm -hmm. And it's not really well I guess it'd be regional to the extent that temperature regimes vary from one region to the next, but the, the primary determinant is the temperature. Very interesting. Ron, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate you sharing all your knowledge. It's been very interesting. <laughs> and thank you to everyone that joined us today. We appreciate you taking the time to hang out with us. So it's awesome. Great. Glad to do it. Thanks everybody for attending. Thank you.